2015 is the year that Warren Buffett, the famed investor, took control of Berkshire Hathaway. In that year, Robert Gottliebson, you were the business editor of the Sydney Morning Herald. I'd just taken that job in, in, in Sydney, yes. Alan, you were in short pants, but uh, <laughs> by the time that Warren Buffett became famous, by about the 70s, you just started your cadetship then. Um, what is it about Warren Buffett that really interests you in terms of his investment principles? Oh well, the, the um, he oh, look. I think the the great thing about Warren Buffett is not only is he good at, in, at investing, he's good at communicating. He's fantastic at at sort of at, at statements about investing and 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 have made mem many memorable comments. But I mean, the thing I suppose the fundamental thing is he's he's achieved twenty one percent compound return over fifty years. And when he took control of Berkshire Hathaway, uh, the shares were eleven and three eighths dollars. Today the A shares are two hundred and twenty-three thousand dollars, and from eleven dollars then to two hundred twenty-three thousand now is twenty-one percent compound growth over fifty years. Now that has been achieved by nobody else, and so and has he done it? Well, he's done it by uh, buy and hold. He's done it by buy and hold. He, he he buys something and he sticks with it. He said one of one of his famous statements is his preferred uh, time frame is forever. And also his philosophy, of course, is to buy when the market is nervous and sell when the market is happy. Um, and that's sort of where the markets are now a little bit, you know. So do you think Robert Leibson, looking at the market, that if you were Warren Buffett, he'd be buying at this point in time? I think he'd move. First of all, he's a, a, a tremendous analyst of, of bank stocks and, and leading stocks. Um, I, I, I think he'd have, well, he has. He's, he's moved into the American market. When that global financial crisis took place, guess who was the big buyer? Um, I think Warren Buffett in, in today's world in Australia and, and the US, it's made for these guys. Because what we've got is a series of institutional analysts, particularly in Australia but also in the US, who don't really understand the fundamentals. They have all these ratios and stuff and projections and stuff like that. And as soon as a company slips and doesn't meet their criteria, they sell all the stock. You can just imagine what that is for Warren Buffett, who, who sees good stocks just pummeled by silly institutions. And, and you see it every time. Um, every time a, a good stock has a bad year, or a bad half year, um, the, 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 the institutions just flog it. Marvellous for Buffett's. Well, he says, one of the things he says is that the greatest thing for him is when a great company gets into temporary trouble. Yes. He loves it. Yes. But it's funny because he's a value investor and he's, he's got a Bible, you know, uh, in terms of how you should look at stocks. And the funny thing is, though, there's not a lot of value investors out there that he seems to be the one who really leads the way in this. But most oh, there's lots of people who call themselves value investors, right? And everyone sort of talks about Warren Buffett and everyone reads his books and heaps of people go to his annual meetings and read his annual, you know, his annual letter to shareholders. But very few people actually do what he does because it's very hard to do that. You can't... Like to buy and hold is a very difficult strategy because um, uh, the, what Warren Buffett does that, that particularly ordinary investors can't do is he controls the company, right? So he he backs management, but if the management's no good, he changes them. Like he he runs the company, so it's all very well to say he buys and holds, but he likes companies. Warren Buffett likes companies that an idiot could run could run, because eventually, sooner or later, one will. Yes, and his great talent is that he can pick when that idiot's turned up. <laughs> he's, he's a, more seriously, he's a very good judge of managers and boards and, and how that company's running. And, and I think, taking your point one step further, uh, lots of people value invest, but they don't always have a way of evaluating the management of the company. And bad managers do get in there, and you have to recognise them. They're not easy to find, not easy to discover, because you, but they all look pretty good on the, on the surface. Buffett's good at it. He, when, when he talks to a manager, he gets an instinctive view. This, this person or this group uh, know what they're doing. But That's one thing you would say about him, though, is that he's, there are 600 companies in the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio, but a lot of those are what you would describe as simple companies, things like insurance. He loves Coca-Cola. He loves railways, sort of staple things that everybody has to use all the time. And so he's always said, if I don't understand it, I don't want to invest in it. But as a result, he missed out on the entire tech boom. So given all the disruptions that are happening right now, perhaps it's not the right time for a, for a Buffett-type investment philosophy. Well, he missed out on the 1990s tech boom, and I think he was pretty happy about having missed out on that, to be honest, because he missed out on the crash as well. Mm. Um, but I'm not familiar with whether he's investing in tech companies now. But you're right. I mean, he's investing in 
in simple companies that he understands and um, and uh, you know uh, doing incredibly well. He loves strong brands like Coca Cola. He likes insurance companies because he loves the float. You know, he, he just thinks the float is a magnificent thing. That the insurance company has all this money. Yeah, I, I, I it, uh, his successes um, are now um, beginning their run. And I noticed one of them got caught on General Motors. See, General Motors is a lovely company from Warren Buffett's point of view. And what happened? They got a huge recall. So he suffered on that. Um, but if he's right about the basic stock and its management, he'll be fine. Because that stock will have fallen because of a specific event, which if, if the company is being run properly, shouldn't happen again. Uh, and they'll probably even gain from the fact that they get momentum from it. So. He's, uh, but that's the that's the start of these guys. It's interesting. If he was coming to Australia now, you know, Warren Buffett coming to our country and saying, "I'm going to start up here and I'm going to look for the same things." The first the first companies he'd look at, of course, would be the banks. Um, and I suspect he'd probably he would have certainly invested in banks years ago because they were just perfect for, for Warren Buffett. They're now substantially above the value of other world banks. He can buy a bank in the US at a much cheaper price. I suspect he probably wouldn't buy our banks at this point in time. What do you think, Alan? Oh, no, definitely not. I mean, they're not, they're not cheap enough. They're not distressed enough. They're yeah. fine. Um, and they're well priced. But there's one thing you would say about Buffett. He's always said that his favourite kind of stock is one which has a so-called moat around it, that it's effectively in a protected industry where there aren't many competitors or there aren't any way of competitors coming in and disrupting that. And certainly the Australian banks, you know, with the four pillars policy, really can't be disrupted by, by outside forces. That's right. I mean, that's right. But but there's four of them, and they're well priced. So I mean, I don't think he'd. Uh, I don't think he'd be interested in he'd, them. To be he'd honest, he'd probably go for Telstra and CSL. Um, um, both those are pretty well surrounded by a moat um, in their own industries. Telstra certainly is. Yeah. Um, oh, I think CSL probably is. It's got a rival in the state, but basically in the, in the businesses it's in, it's plasma. There's not that many rivals in there. Plenty uh, of regulation, which helps a lot in terms of keeping other entrants out. You know, you wonder whether you'd buy BHP. At what point would Warren Buffett buy BHP? <laughs> because in, certainly in iron ore, uh, with uh, Vale and with uh, Rio, they, they, they have the chance to control this market. Um, because they're, they're clearly squeezing out all the other small players. Do you think he'd have a go for it? I don't think he's much of an investor in mining companies. No, he's not. He's not. That's true. No, I mean, I, um, I mean, the other thing to mention about Warren Buffett is he's only ever paid one dividend in the entire life of Berkshire Hathaway, 50 years. Does not pay dividends, which is why the stock's $223,000. Um, and he's all about growth. He says, if you want cash, sell the stock, sell some stock. But um, he doesn't believe in dividends. And the reason for that is because he says, if you've bought a good company and it's got a good return on capital, why not reinvest the money in that company? Like, and allow the company to just keep the money rather than pay it out and have to pay tax on the dividends, even if it's franked in our case. Um, uh, leave the money in the company so that it can continue to grow. And, and, and that's another way in which he is not followed by the people who say that they follow him. Because uh, most investors are looking for dividends, particularly in Australia. Yes. Um, and, and he's not looking for dividends. He wants growth. We'll have to leave it there. Thanks very much.